Hey, it's Ben, and welcome to Lecture 6 of Open Project Space. We are talking about communication protocols again, but instead of focusing on their fundamentals and UART as it relates to Arduino, we are going to shift the conversation to two other very popular protocols, SPI and I squared C. But before we begin this new discussion, I want to talk about some use of terminology in the world of communication protocols and, and really device communication in general, regardless of whether it's embedded system or computer networks, you'll see these terms master and slave. Now, they're rather inappropriate given their connection to American chattel slavery. And so we are transitioning to new terminology. But the reason why I bring this up is because a lot of what is brought up in documentation has not yet been translated into the new, more accepted terminology. So what we discuss in lecture and lab uh, is going to differ from what is written in our data sheets. But uh, whatever I say, whatever's in the lecture slides, or comes from the rest of Open Project Space's team will not use uh, this antiquated terminology. We have a quick translation table for you and we tried to align this with what other organizations are shifting these terms to. Uh, so instead of using master, we'll refer to certain things as controllers. Instead of using slave, we'll use peripheral. Miso is translated to pokey. Mosi is pico. SS is CS. And I know these terms, those abbreviations especially, won't make sense just yet, but you will see them used in future slides. And so when you go back to a data sheet later, in your life and you see something that says MISO and you're like, I never learned about this, but I remember watching this uh, lecture, you'll know MISO actually means pokey and so on. And with that, let's get started with SPI or Serial Peripheral Interface Protocol. It is a serial communication protocol which is synchronized with the clock. So this is dissimilar to UART where we had no clock. It's an asynchronous protocol. And also, uh, data is transferred continuously in SPI. There's no concept of a frame format here like there was for UART. There are no packets, no start bits, stop bits, parity bits, nothing like that. It's just a continuous stream of data. And in this communication, we'll have one device which acts as a controller here to one or more peripheral devices. And so as you can imagine from the wording here, you'll have the controller basically control the peripherals. Usually a conversation will be initiated by the controller. It might say something like, hey, peripheral device, I want you to pay attention to me now and, and send me this information back. And the peripheral will respond with that information. And so in this communication, we can describe it as a full duplex uh, transmission mode because the controller can send information to the peripheral at the same time the peripheral is sending information back to the controller. And we can observe that through the layout of the devices and their pins. And so we have PICO, which is short for peripheral in, controller out. It is the line uh, that the controller uses to send data to the peripheral. Peripheral in, controller out. Hopefully that makes sense. We have the pokey line. That's peripheral out controller in. And so from the phrasing, I bet you can already guess that this is the line for the peripheral to output information and send it into the controller. Peripheral out, controller in. Our third line is the clock line. This is that shared clock signal. This is what it means for a protocol to be synchronized unlike UART in our previous lecture. And so the controller will output a clock signal by which both the controller and the peripheral will time its data. And our last line, the fourth line, is the CS or chip select line. This allows the controller to select which peripheral it would like to send data. Because remember, there can be multiple peripherals to our one controller. And let's see, what that would look like instead of uh, there are two major configurations one is called daisy chaining which is not the configuration we have in this layout this is one in which we have a chip select line for each peripheral and so again there's one controller but in this example we have three peripherals 
And this controller might be a microcontroller like an Arduino, and it generates a clock signal, one clock signal to all of the peripherals, which is shared. Yet there is a chip select line for each peripheral, peripheral one, peripheral two, peripheral three. And it's pretty straightforward. If we wanted to communicate with just one of these peripherals and we could only do uh, one at a time because they all share a pokey line, we would basically send a signal over one of these chip select lines saying peripheral one, uh, it's go time. But then over chip select line two and three, uh, we wouldn't send any signal. And that's how peripheral two and three know not to communicate at all. So the controller runs the show. And, and remember, we could add more peripherals. We could add a fourth one, a fifth one. We would just need an additional chip select line for each of them. Let's talk about how transmission works. It basically happens in two steps. The first of which is for the controller to select the peripheral it wants by pulling an idle high voltage signal to a low signal along the CS or chip select line. Now the next step is for either the controller or the peripheral to start talking. Let's say the controller starts by sending data to the selected peripheral along the PICO line. This is the peripheral in, controller out line. So the controller is sending data to the peripheral. And the bits of this signal are synchronized with the rising edge of the oscillating clock signal shared over the S clock, the clock line. And so you'll notice along each of these rising edges, there is one bit of data being transmitted. And the same applies for when the peripheral might also send data along the pokey line, pokey being peripheral out, controller in. This is when the peripheral is outputting data into the controller. It will also be synchronized to the clock signal. And remember, these can occur simultaneously. That's what makes SPI a full duplex protocol. All right. We're going to move on to I squared C, but after we conclude our discussion of I squared C, we're going to compare all three protocols which we've learned split among these two lectures. That's UART, that's SPI, that's I squared C, and really see which one is more powerful in certain applications and which protocols may not be as useful in those same applications. So for now, Let's talk about I squared C, the third of the protocols which we will discuss in these two communication protocols lectures. I squared C is the inter-integrated circuit protocol. It is another synchronized serial protocol, but unlike UART and SPI, I squared C supports multiple controllers. So it can use multiple controllers and have multiple peripherals. It also features acknowledgments to confirm if messages are received, and it's also used for addressing the peripherals. I'll explain what addressing means in a moment. But uh, the important thing to remember about the acknowledgments is this is a form of error checking, similar to UART, which had that parity bit. Uh, that parity bit was used to verify the integrity of the data being sent. Now, I squared C uses acknowledgments not to verify data integrity, but basically as a way to see if the devices are still communicating. And I will explain that in just a slide or two. I squared C is a half duplex communication protocol. I will show you why on this next slide where we discuss the I squared C layout. So. What you've already noticed from this diagram is there are only two communication lines here. One is called SDA, that's for serial data. That's the line for the controller and peripheral to send and receive data. And then we have SCL, that's the serial clock. That's where the controller outputs the clock signal by which the controller and peripheral will synchronize their outputs. All peripherals will share the same two SDA and SCL lines. So hopefully you can already notice that I squared C is one of the more compact protocols that we shared. It has a smaller bus, a bus being a collection of communication lines. This bus only has two lines, much like UART, which only had two lines, and far less than SPI, 
which required four lines. And the reason why we called I squared C a half duplex protocol is because they send each other data over the same line. So the controller can't feasibly send information to the peripheral at the same time the peripheral sends information to the controller. So they have to take turns. That's a half duplex protocol. And so you can imagine from that being half duplex, I squared C might be slower than a full duplex protocol like SPI. Because in SPI, communication can occur at the same time the controller can send information to the peripheral at the same time the peripheral can send information to the controller. Here in I squared C, they have to wait. So now let's talk about the frame format for I squared C and then we'll pivot into how these frames are actually transmitted. This frame format is long. So the frames are called messages. Instead of the UART packets, we call I squared C frames messages. There is a start condition. That is the first part of the message. And then it's followed by an address frame. So this is how I squared C facilitates communication with multiple peripherals without requiring some sort of chip select line like SPI did. Each peripheral has a unique address. And so in this message that the controller will send out, it will say, hey, peripheral with this specific address, I'm talking to you. And all the peripherals will check their address, which is hard coded usually into the device, or possibly is a programmer can come in and configure that address. The peripherals will compare the address they received from the controller to their own address. And if it matches, the peripheral will respond. If it doesn't, the peripheral will realize, oh, this isn't my conversation, I'm gonna sit out. Now, the next part of the message is a read-write bit. This is what indicates from the controller whether or not it is sending or requesting data from the peripheral. This is, again, why we use that terminology controller and peripheral. The controller is running the show. It gets to decide whether or not the peripheral is going to be sending data or if it's going to be listening for data. Now, the peripheral with that matching address is then going to send an acknowledgement. This we're going to call an ACK. Uh, there is also a not acknowledged uh, response, which would be called a NAC with an N. Now, this ACK, this single bit, is going to be the peripheral's confirmation that it has received the read and write bit. It knows now what's going on. It's either going to be sending data to the controller or waiting for data from the controller. But it will confirm that with an ACK bit. And so the next part of the message will be the actual data exchange. So depending on whether that message is a read or write, either the controller or peripheral will send data frames. Let's say it was a read. So the controller is telling the peripheral, I want you to send me data. The peripheral will start sending data frames. Each is eight bits or one byte. It'll send one data frame to the controller. The controller will respond with an acknowledgement, with an ACK, and then, only then, will the peripheral send the next data frame if one is available. So notice this is how we make sure these acknowledgements are how we make sure that the devices are actually online and ready to communicate. If the peripheral is waiting for an ACK and it does not receive one, it knows something's up. There's no point in sending data because the controller is long gone and it will continue doing so until a certain stopping point. Now, uh, let's imagine the opposite case in which the controller has sent a write command. That will indicate to the peripheral, oh, I'm listening. And so now the controller will send the data frames to the peripheral, and the peripheral will send the acknowledgments back to the controller. OK, and this will continue again until, in the case of a write, the controller just stops sending data and it, it indicates, hey, we're done by signaling a stop condition. Or if the controller is reading from the peripheral, it will send a NAC, not acknowledged, to end the data transmission. 
once that peripheral receives a knack, uh, it will know, oh, we're done here. So after that step, no matter what, whether we are in, no matter what, whether we are in read or write mode, the controller terminates communication with the stop condition. Now, another controller, remember, I squared C supports multiple controllers and multiple peripherals. Another controller at this point may send a message once it sees that stop signal. So we've talked about this communication uh, in the context of the actual frame format. But now let's do that in more of a step-by-step -step view of the signals over the I squared C lines. So let's say we are starting an I squared C transmission. Step one will always be for one of the controllers to output the start condition to all the connected peripherals. So this start condition is a high voltage pulled to a low voltage on the SDA line, high to low. And then it will be followed by a high voltage pulled to a low voltage on the SCL line. And now once this happens, all the other controllers that might be sharing these lines know, oh, we ran out of time. We can't start a communication. We have to wait until this transmission is done. And that's how one controller establishes the start of its transmission. Step two is for the controller to send that address to identify the peripheral it would like to communicate with. Now, it's going to send that address over the SDA line. Remember, SDA is where all the data transmission happen. SCL is reserved for the clock signal. And each peripheral will compare its own address to the address it receives from the controller. The last bit of the address is going to be the read and write bit of our I squared C message. And so the peripherals will compare. Peripheral one sees that, oh, the address I received from the controller isn't mine. I'm going to shut up. Peripheral two will decide on the same thing. And peripheral three has decided, oh my gosh, it's my day. This is my address. Let's get talking. And so step three will be that acknowledgement. Now the peripheral three, who's determined their address is the correct one, for the communication is going to send an acknowledgement over the SDA line back to the controller. And the controller now knows it's time for the data to actually be transmitted. So depending on that read or write bit, the controller is either sending or receiving the data frame. So in this case, uh, in the diagram on the right, the controller is transmitting data to the peripheral. Uh, these are the ones and zeros over the SDA line. And after each transmission, the receiving device, in this case, it's the peripheral, peripheral three, it's going to send an acknowledgement back indicating a successful transmission. And this will keep on happening in those 8-bit data frames until step five, where either uh, in that read mode where the controller is listening to the peripheral, it's going to send a not acknowledged, a knack back to the peripheral, or when the controller is transmitting data to the peripheral, the controller is just going straight to the stop condition, where the voltage of the SCL line is going to be pulled to a high, and then the SDA line is going to be pulled to a high. That is the stop condition, and then the message is complete. And so you'll notice that when an I squared C transmission is complete, uh, when the controllers and peripherals are in idle, and they're waiting for the next transmission to stop, the SDA line and the SCL line will be in an idle high voltage. That summarizes I squared C transmission. And so why do we talk about I squared C and SPI? Uh, whereas when we talked about UART, we showed you how it directly connects to our Arduino code. It's because in the scope of our open project space or ops projects, SPI and I squared C are not used directly. They're under the hood. They're running behind the scenes of the libraries, which we use to interface with these devices. For example, in one of our projects, we might use SPI to communicate with a radio module, except the library we use in our Arduino code is for the radio module. So we might run a command that says radio.begin, radio.write message, something like that. And while you don't see it, what is happening is when those commands run, your Arduino microcontroller board 
is communicating with the radio module over SPI. The same is true for I squared C. In one of our projects, we might use I squared C as a form of communicating with a, an LCD or liquid crystal display. And the reason being is that the liquid crystal display, which is responsible for displaying text, that's its primary use, it has a parallel protocol traditionally. And so it runs about eight plus lines off the side of the module. Those are eight plus lines that you would have to connect to your Arduino board. And that's a lot. So instead, we can make use of the I squared C protocol, which is more compact. It only has two lines. And so we add an additional module to the back of the LCD. It connects to the parallel protocol pins of the LCD and translates that protocol into I squared C. And so then we only have to consider two lines for communication, which is very convenient when you are working in a small space. It cleans up the number of wires on your breadboard quite nice. So now that we've talked about UART, we've talked about SPI and I squared C, let's do a little bit of comparing. This is more of a summary of some of the things we've already discussed. Now take a look at this table. We examine each protocol in a column here, I squared C, SPI, UART, and then on the far left column, we examine them by category. So remember, the number of lines that will facilitate UART is two. For SPI, it's four or more. It's one more for each additional peripheral which you are connecting to. That gets quite big. And I squared C again is just two lines. The number of controllers for UART will always be one. That's a, a big limitation. The same is true for SPI. But for I squared C, you could have one or more controllers on that same set of lines. Now for UART, we also only have one peripheral. That is the largest limitation of UART here. You can only ever have one controller and one peripheral. The same is not true for SPI, where you can have one or more peripherals. And again, I squared C also supports one or more peripherals. So when we're talking about number of controllers versus number of peripherals, we find that UART is most restrictive and I squared C has the most flexibility. When we talk about transmission types, UART can be used up to full duplex transmission. The same is true for SPI, but I squared C is limited to half duplex. That's the trade-off between the number of lines and the transmission type. Because I squared C has reduced its number of lines to two, and remember I squared C is a synchronized protocol, so one of those lines is a clock signal and one of those is a data line, it's going to have a half duplex transmission. Now the controllers and peripherals have to share a communication line and they have to wait for each other to communicate instead of talking at the same time. And so your takeaway can be that at least when comparing these two synchronized protocols, whereas UART is asynchronous, I squared C is going to be slower than SPI because it is half duplex, because it can transmit uh, hypothetically at half the amount of data that SPI can at the same clock signal. Let's talk about error checking. UART has the capacity to do some error checking just built into the protocol's frame format because it does have a parity bit. That's for data integrity checking. SPI doesn't have any error checking, inherently at least, because it is just a continuous stream of bits. There's no frame format, there's no parity bit, there's no acknowledgments. It's just that continuous stream. I squared C has acknowledgments. That's a way to confirm whether or not the devices are actually communicating so that a peripheral isn't just spewing out information forever at a controller or vice versa when one of them isn't actually connected or online. And in the final category where we consider speed, Comparing all three protocols, we find that UART is the slowest. Part of the reason being that it is not a synchronized protocol, and not to get too far in the weeds here, but that is a limitation set in the design of these UART interfaces, the UART devices, because UART is a physical device that facilitates the communication between other UARTs. They have set 
baud rates. Those baud rates don't get faster when you have a faster microcontroller that's running the UART. They're configured within the interface. You can change the baud rate within a predefined set, but outside that, we find that most baud rates are much slower than SPI or I squared C's potential clock speeds. And when comparing SPI and I squared C, which are both synchronized protocols, the clear, the clearest reason for SPI being faster is because it is a full duplex protocol, is because the controllers and peripherals can talk to each other at the same time, whereas that is not possible with I squared C. And so, again, remember the trade-off is I squared C is more compact than SPI. So you're trading size for speed. And when we look at all three protocols, we find that in that speed category, again, UART is slowest, S I squared C. And, and so I hope you can see the bigger picture that... And so I hope you can see that the bigger picture is that not one of these protocols dominates in all these categories. And so you have to give close consideration to how you are applying a protocol to your project. Is this what is best suited for my project, which has maybe one controller or two controllers, 12 peripherals versus one peripheral, one project in which maybe transmission time or speed is super important. We need high speed stuff. If speed is not as important and you really want a small project, maybe you're looking for a protocol with fewer lines. Those are the kind of considerations. And so in wrapping up our discussion, we are going to answer a couple of questions about these three protocols, about which works better in which case. Some general questions about, you know, which is which transmission type, what are the relative speeds, questions like those. And so I invite you, pause the video right now, go to our website, pull up the downloadable PDF, answer these questions on your own, and then return and compare your answers to the correct answers which I'm about to provide to you with short explanations. So I've given you that moment to pause. Now we're going to unpause and answer all the questions. So the first question is, which of the following is a full duplex communication protocol? Our options are SPI, I squared C, both SPI and I squared C, or neither of which. And the answer is going to be SPI. Remember, I squared C is a half duplex protocol. The controllers and peripherals share one data line for their communication, whereas SPI has a dedicated line for the controller to output to the peripheral and a dedicated line for the peripheral to output to the controller. So the next question is, which of the following protocols doesn't require an additional line to support multiple devices on the same bus? Option A is SPI, option B is I squared C. It could be both SPI and I squared C, or it could be neither SPI or I squared C. And the answer would be I squared C. The reason being, in I squared C, we only ever have two lines. Each time we add a peripheral or a controller, they still share the same SDA and SCL line, same clock and same data line. With SPI, we only have one controller, but when we add peripherals, we have to add an additional chip select line for each peripheral. Next question would be, which of the following protocols supports multiple controllers and peripherals? And the options are A, SPI, B, I squared C, C, UART, or D, both UART and I squared C. And the answer would be B, I squared C. That's because SPI only supports one controller. UART only supports one controller and one peripheral. And so that leaves I squared C, which supports multiple controllers and multiple peripherals. Next question is, which of the following protocols doesn't have start and stop bits? The options are A, SPI, B, I squared C, C, UART, or D, both UART and I squared C. And the answer is SPI. 
Remember, SPI doesn't have a frame format like I squared C and UART. It is a continuous stream of bits. And so SPI is the only protocol here on this list that doesn't have those start bits and stop bits. Next question is a fill in the blank. The SCLK, the S clock, the Pico, Pokey, and CS are the four data lines in blank protocol. Now, my takeaway from here would be without even reading the options, this would have to be SPI because SPI traditionally has four data lines. That's more than I squared C or UART. And so, Naturally, that's going to leave us with option A, SPI. Next question is, which of the following communication protocols is a synchronous protocol? A, SPI, B, I squared C, C, UART, or D, both SPI and I squared C. Remember that UART is asynchronous. It's in the name, Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. So that crosses out you are. That leaves us with I squared C and SPI. And if you can recall from our slides before, they both have clock signals. So they must be synchronized. That leaves us with option D, both SPI and I squared C. The next question is, which of the following protocols needs a clock? I kind of just gave this away. Option A is SPI, option B is I squared C, C is UART, and D is both SPI and I squared C. If you are a synchronous protocol, you share a clock signal. And so it must be D, both SPI and I squared C, as UART is asynchronous. It doesn't require a clock. Next question is uh, another fill in the blank. The receiver and transmitter are the two data lines in blank protocol. Well, our options are A, SPI, B, I squared C, C, UART, or D, both SPI and I squared C. And straight away, I'll tell you that the answer is C UART. And you can determine this from a number of factors. One is which, if this were another of the protocols, then it would have to have a clock line. If this were another one of the protocols, if it were SBI, it would have more than just two lines. So that really only leaves us with UART, option C. So the next question is, which of the following protocols needs a chip select line? The answer to that is either A, SPI, B, I squared C, C, UART, or D, both SPI and I squared C. The answer is A. SPI requires a chip select line for each peripheral. Unlike I squared C, which uses addressing to determine the peripheral, and UART, which doesn't have a concept of addressing because there's only one peripheral. Next question is, which of the following protocols is a single controller, single peripheral communication protocol? Options are A, SPI, B, I squared C, C, UART, or D, both SPI and I squared C. And the answer is C, UART. I squared C supports multiple controllers, multiple peripherals. SPI supports one controller, and multiple peripherals. The next question is, how many signal lines does I squared C protocol require? So the answer is either option A, which is one, option B, which is two, or option C, which is four. And the answer will be option B, which is two signal lines. We have one line for data, that's SDA, and one line for the clock signal, that's SCL. Next question is, how many signal lines does UART protocol require? The answer again is either A1, B2, or C, which is four. The answer is B, or two. UART has an RX line and a TX line. Next question is, which of the following protocols is best for multiple peripherals over the fewest lines? So now instead of thinking about just raw facts about the protocols, you are encouraged to to think about which protocol is best suited for which application. The options are A, SPI, B, I squared C, or C, UART. And the answer here is B, I squared C. There are only two protocols which support the least amount of signal lines, which would either be I squared C or UART. 
only one of which, I squared C, supports multiple peripherals. So again, the answer is B, I squared C. Next question is, which of the following protocols is best for multiple peripherals with the highest transmission rate? Your options are SPI, I squared C, or UART. And so the answer would be A, SPI, because SPI is a synchronous protocol which supports full duplex communication. And so it conquers I squared C in terms of speed because I squared C is limited to half duplex transmissions. So again, the answer is A, SPI. Which of the following protocols is best for full duplex communication with multiple peripherals? The answer would again be A, SPI. The only options for multiple peripheral protocols would be SPI and I squared C. And SPI is the full duplex option. Which of the following protocols consumes less power? This is the last question. And this is one that... Uh, is not alluded to really in any previous part of this lecture, but I want you to try to extend your thinking based on what you do know. And so when electricity is applied to a device, some amount of power is consumed, even when it's over wires. And so we, when we put it into those terms, you could imagine that the protocol with the slower transmission rate might consume less power for one because less data is being transmitted. And the other factor to consider is that one protocol here has fewer lines to transmit information over. That's I squared C. I squared C has two lines, whereas SPI has four. And so the odds here are kind of stacked in I squared C's favor because the answer is B. I squared C will consume less power than SPI. And so that's that last consideration that we didn't talk about in previous slides. But you might be working on a project which needs to be extraordinarily low power. You have limited battery life or a very small form factor uh, power supply. Or for some other consideration like environmental impact, you want to make power consumption as low as possible. You might choose I squared C over SPI. And that concludes our lecture. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, I wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, and I will talk to you in the next lecture.